Yeah, thank you very much for this nice introduction and for the invitation to speak to you in journey and slavery. This returns give already the outline of my subject I will present you here today. But at the beginning of my idea for this presentation, actually my question was, which impact has the world of slavery on ancient texts, especially on their narratives? This is a question that is fascinating me since a long time. One of my favorite examples are the ancient novels. Slavery is here as always omnipresent. In the novels we find all kinds of slavery and slave characters. But slaves are not only an integral part of the novel, slavery is also the driving force behind the narration. Slavery, especially the lowest forms of slavery, as for example prostitution, are used to visualize and to dramatize the social descent and later salvation of the principal characters. So I realized to which extent metaphors, practices, and concepts of slavery were used for literary narratives. But today I will not speak about fictional texts, but about the perceptual representation of Roman embers of late antiquity. The basis for my analysis are definitely non-fictional texts, but also these authors do not simply document, but, as I will show, follow narrative strategies in their historical descriptions. My object is now not to analyze the whole structure of a narrative, that means the sequence of events. In the following I have chosen excerpts, small stories, from historical narrations that use slavery, that means terms or practices of, as a figure for what. I want to show in the following presentation how metaphors, terms and practices from the world of slavery are used to characterize the person of the rule of late antique Roman emperors and especially the emperors of the so-called tetrarchy at the end of the third century and beginning of the fourth century. I've chosen this special time because it is a time of multiple changes and challenges. But I will come back to the historical background and I will come back later. The story that puzzled me so much that I decided to investigate further was an excerpt from a compendium of Roman history. The author is Eutrope, the Roman historian of the late 4th century AD. This excerpt brings us in the year 297 AD. The background is a conflict between the Persian king Nazis and the Roman emperor Galerius. In Kari, a town in nowadays Turkey, Galerius is defeated and takes flight to his co-emperor Diocletian. But instead of support, there is creation. And I quote, and you can read the text on the PowerPoint. Galerius Maximian, in acting against Narsois, fought on the first occasion a battle far from successful, meeting him between Kalinikos and Kare, and engaging in the combat rather with rashness than want of courage. Being conquest defeated and going to join Diocletian, he was received by him when he met him on the road with such extreme haughtiness that he said to have run by his chariot for several miles in his scarlet robes. After having recollected his horses, Galerius fought a second time with Narsois, and this time with success. He puts Narsus into flight, he captures his wife, sisters and children, as well as a vast number of Persian nobility, and returns in triumph to Diocletian. This time he is welcomed by him with great honor. 
uh, this episode has been adopted and adapted by other ancient authors such as uh, Amianus Marcellinus. Amianus cites the story in a different context near the later phase of the 4th century. The main actors are the successors of Emperor Constantine. Amian cites the episode as a not-so-old example to illustrate the subordinate position of the Caesars in relation to the higher-ranking emperors. Emperor Constantius II asked the Caesar Gallus for support against the raids of Germanic tribes. Given his efforts for the unity and security of the empire, he reminds Gallus of the role of the Caesars in the first tetrarchy, that means in the time of Diocletian. This is of the Augusti as apparitores, as official servants. And I quote, to this he added an example of not so very great antiquity, that Diocletian and his colleague Maximianus were obeyed by their Caesar as by attendants, who did not remain in one place, but hastened about hither and thither, and that in Syria Galerius, clad in purple, walked for nearly a mile before the chariot of his Augustus, when the latter was angry with him. Galerius between humiliation and triumph. This contrast has led researchers to ask whether Galerius' humiliation was a material ceremony. I think it is not the right question to ask whether this episode could have taken place or not. I prefer to analyze how these authors used this narrative and what they wanted to express with it. In this respect, it is interesting that A, Amianus uses a term that leads to the world of dependency when he designates the subordinate emperors as apparitores. And B, this story is indeed an old example, it is a kind of narrative element that does not only appear in late antiquity, but also in much earlier texts. So we have here really a narrative element that is used several times. With these two citations, I've led you deep into the history of the fourth century AD. Before I go further in detail, I will briefly sketch the historical context and above all, the system of government, the Tetrarchy. The Tetrarchy developed in the late 3rd century AD from, uh, from the so-called crisis of the 3rd century of the time of the Soviet emperors. This period was marked by a multitude of problems with which the imperial central authority was confronted increasing pressure on the borders of the Roman Empire, frequent changes of rulers, and a large number of usurpations. The Senate lost its importance, the emperors originated generous emperors over years. Added to this were increasing tax pressures, currency decline, and inflation. With Emperor Diocletian, the situation was consolidated. Diocletian was proclaimed Augustus on November the 20th, 284, in Nicomedia. You see him here in this picture. Diocles, this was his original name, probably came from Dalmatia, from a humble background. He was a freedman, perhaps, or the son of a freedman. He had been promoted to military service, then accepted into the knighthood before becoming emperor. It was a typical example for a Soviet emperor. With this name, the political, administrative, military, and economic reorganization 
of the Roman Empire is associated. Due to the pressure on the borders of the empire, as well as uh, internal uprising, Diocletian appointed another ruler in the year 285. He gave military commands to friends and colleagues. He trusted and appointed Maximian Caesar co-emperor in the west of the Roman Empire. Later, because of reservation and constant invasions in the Rhine and Danube regions, Diocletian appointed two more co-rulers. Constantius Chlorus, the father of Constantine the Great, and the famous Galerius. So, um, after this uh, historical excursus, I come back to the episode described by Eutropius, the humiliation of Galerius. I mentioned some scholars were of the opinion that authors like um, Janus Marcellinus um, misunderstood the episode. The development or the reception of the little story would, be, would have been, in their opinion, as follows. Originally, this story would have been a description of an imperial ceremony. William Sestum, for example, is the pinnacle of the imperial court, would have stipulated that the subordinate Caesar should not sit in the car next to the Augustus, but accompany him on foot. This obvious subordination would have encouraged authors as Samianus Marcellinus to compare it with the master-servant relationship. Later, authors would have reinterpreted this ceremony as a humiliation of Galerius, possibly to disparage Galerius. However, the text as well as the archaeological material show that it is rather unusual for a Caesar to accompany the Augustus on foot. I cite again an example from Ammianus Marcellinus. Ammianus describes the proclamation of violence by his brother, Emperor Valentinian, as follows. Then, in his arrival in Constantinople on the 28th of March, he brought the aforesaid violence into one of the suburbs with the constant of all, proclaimed and proclaimed him Augustus. Then he adorned him with the imperial insignia and put a diadem on his head and brought him back in his own carriage, thus having indeed the lawful partner in his power. But as a further cause of our narrative will show, one was a compliant as a subordinate. In the version of Amian, Valentinian proclaims his brother Valens Augustus, but at the same time expresses the subordination of his brother and co regent Valens by calling him mm, Apparitor. He brings him back in his carriage, so Valens does not have to accompany his brother on foot. In comparison with this description, the episode passed on by Atropius is more an inversion of the ceremony of the proclamation of an emperor. Textual, as well as material sources, illustrate on the one hand the more or less fine gradation between the emperors, but on the other hand, also the concordia, the harmony um, between the four rulers. Most famous is a porphyry group on the four Roman emperors found in Venice, dating around uh, 300 AD. The identification of the individual emperors is a much discussed topic, but it becomes quite clear the group is a symbol for the harmony and unity of the four emperors. Each tetrarch looks the same without any individualized characteristics, except that two, um, probably representing the old Augusti, have beards and two have not. It's divided into 
That's each embracing which unites Augustine and Caesars together. The overall effect is that of unity and stability. There is a hierarchy, but this hierarchy is expressed in a subtle way. So I give you here another example of also a famous example of these tetra groups. And this one is from a, a column in the Vatican. Um, there is a hierarchy, but this hierarchy is expressed in a subtle way, as for example in the case of the Arch of Galerius in Thessaloniki. You can't see it very well, <laughs> but you see here sitting the two Augusti, Diocletian and Maximian, and standing beside them are the two Caesars, the Subonian Caesar, the final a fine gradation in representation. In this context, it is interesting that when Amian uses the term apparitores to designate the Caesars, he is referring to a term that leads us to the word of dependency. The apparitores were servants of the higher Roman, of the Roman higher and lower officials who helped them to carry out their administrative tasks. They were freeborn persons or freedmen who saw the opportunity for social advancement in this position. But in my opinion, one could also go a step further and interpret the description of how Galerius must run next to Diocletian's carriage as an allusion to the relationship between master and slave. Galerius run, runs alongside the carriage like a secus, a compagnine slave, or in front of the car like a precursor. Such a scene is shown, for example, by a grave relief from Athens, the stele of Aristocles from around 400 um, BC. Um, this stele is now in the British Museum, and here the Pedisequus runs after his master riding a horse and holds on to the animal's tail. It is also significant that the allusion to slavery is used after the defeat of Galerius, since victory is an essential part of the imperial ideology. A fine example is, I can show you here, is a mode um, from Olbia and Sardinia, which shows the joint triumph of Diocletian and Maximian. The emperors are sitting in a carriage drawn by four elephants, Surrounded by soldiers, you see here, was the imperial quadriga. The victoriousness of an emperor is essential for the establishment as well as for the preservation of his rule. Conversely, a defeat indicates a loss of authority, which can be visualized through images that are known from everyday slave lives. In our case, the defeated emperor is downgraded to an escort slave. The image is the opposite of the ideology of power, as can be found, for example, on this mode uh, of Olivia or on the arch of Galerius in Thessaloniki, which celebrates the victory over the Persians. So quite the opposite of the, the story I presented before. Images from the world of slavery, as we can see, lead to criticize an emperor's behavior, to illustrate his loss of authority, or to characterize the relationship between emperors. The question is me whether slavery narratives are used in this context only to underline the defeat and loss of authority of Galerius, or more generally, to draw a negative image of the tetrarchy. This view could be supported by a parallel to the episode of Galerius' humiliation. We find this narrative also in another emperor's biography. This Suetonius biography of the ruler, and he passes on the following episode. 
more was he more admired or respectful in his behavior towards the Senate? Some who had borne the highest offices in the government were together and to attend him at supper, sometimes at the head of his couch, sometimes at his feet. Part of the negative stigmatization of Emperor Caligula is his behavior towards the Senate. He degrades high-ranking officials by treating them as slaves. As typical slave activities, Sueton chooses the escorting slaves, with the slaves, so the precursores and the perisequi, and the slaves attending during meals. The criticism of Caligula is based on a senatorial historiography that stigmatizes the behavior of the emperor as a violation of laws and customs when he is publicly dishonoring members of the aristocracy. In Diocletian's case, however, the aggression is not directed against the Senate, but the co-emperor Galerius. But in both cases, the act means a gesture of authority, of degradation, and of subordination. In her book, in her book, Arbitrary Rule, Slavery, Tyranny, and the Power of Life and Death, the author Marin Nyquist describes this slavery narrative as political slavery. And she distinguishes it from the institution of slavery. Nyquist analyzes how the concept of political slavery has been used to describe political oppression since ancient times. Terms from the field of slavery were used by opposition groups to identify the tyrant. Nyquist also analyzes the persistence of this concept and traces back its use in political philosophy and in literature from Greek and Roman antiquity to the early modern period. Thus, she argues, political slavery became a motive relating to despotism. As such, political slavery was used to characterize the emperor Caligula. Significantly, the same constellation also appears with regard to Diocletian's rule the wording of the ancient authors, the Trope speaks of Diocletian's, Diocletian's imprudence in Silencia, a man of the furious emperor. This leads me to the question whether Diocletian shall also be characterized here with this metaphors as a tyrant. In this respect, it is remarkable that also other authors compared Diocletian with Caligula or Domitian, both symbols for emperors with a rather poor reputation, a reputation as tyrants. So in order not to overinterpret the allusions to slavery and their interpretation, I will extend my analysis and put the little episode in a broader context of Adorp's narration. At the beginning of his description of Diocletian's rule, Adorp stresses the emperor's low social origins. According to him, Diocletian was son of a scribe or a freedman. Then, Diocletian personally steps the murderer of his predecessor, Numerian, and distresses all Egypt with severe proscriptions and massacres. But on the other hand, he ruled with foresight and made, I quote, so I hope, many judicious, long-lasting arrangements and regulations. It's an amb ambivalent, but also balanced characterization of Diocletian. We find this kind of um, balanced characterization also in this excerpt I present you here. Um, and he says, Diocletian was of a clever nature, a subtle mind. He tried to support his own severity through alien hatred, yet he was the most conscientious and skillful of brain caps. He was the first to introduce the form of a more royal ceremonial in the Roman Empire, 
then it would have corresponded to the Roman sense of freedom. He let himself be worshipped, while before him everyone was only greeted. He added gemstone jewelry to clothing and footwear. Before that, the insignia of power only consisted of the purple coat. Everything else was quite ordinary. This excerpt is stressing above all the opposition between the royal ceremonial and the Roman sense of freedom. And to have a look at the other emperors, I'm much talking about Diocletian, but the other emperors are characterized by Autropius differently. Maximian is raucous, uncivilized, and gruff. Constantius, an excellent man of excellent affability and modesty, adorable, worthy of veneration, and Galerius is considered a righteous and excellent military. So for comparison, the description of another historian of the fourth century, Aurelius Victor. In his book, The Liber de Caesaribus, so he characterizes Diocletian as follows. Valerius Diocletianus, the commander of the imperial bodyguard, an important man chosen by the decision of the troop leaders and tribunes because of his prudence, but he was of the following nature. He was the first to wear a golden robe and ask for his feet silk, purple and precious stones after Caligula and Domitian. He was the first to be officially called Master Dominus and to be worshipped and called God. Because of these things, especially the lowest are, if they are brought into a high position, unrestrained in their self confidence and ambition. But in the case of Valerius, that means Diocletian, this was hidden by the other good qualities. And while he was called master, he presented himself as a father. As in the case of the text of Atropius, the ambivalence in Diocletian's characterization is striking. Diocletian is called master and god, dominus et deus, but also father. He's characterized as haughty and ambitious, and he was the first to wear a golden robe and precious silk and purple shoes. In this narrative on Diocletian, Aurelius Victor again uses terms and images that originate from the world of slavery. The slave master is referred as a dominus, for example. That means Diocletian rules over his empire like a master over his slaves. And as a father, a pater familias, over his household, over wife's children and slaves. That means we have here a double characterization of Diocletian's rule, a master and a father. This passage shows both the traditional and the new view of Diocletian's reign. The proclamation of Diocletian and the additional legitimation by the sun god is in the tradition of the previous emperors. On the other hand, the emperor breaks with this tradition by adopting a new costume that is no longer neither the toga nor the military costume, but also by being addressed as Dominus et Deus, an address that is not at all compatible with the ideology and the representation of the former soldier emperors. The emperor is not anymore, as in the time of the early emperors, the first among equals. He is superior. His rule is defined by clear hierarchies and subordination. The dominant rule and the subordination are also manifest as Caligula and Domitian, and the allusion to the world of slavery. And here I can come back again to the little story, the narrative element from the beginning. In his biography of Domitian, the other poor emperor, so it one uses again this slavery narrative. 
I quote, he likewise designed an expedition into Gaul and Germany without the least necessity for it. And contrary to the advice of all his father's friends, and this he did only with the view of equaling his brother in military achievements and glory. So this he was severely reminded that he might the more effectually be reminded, reminded of his age and position, was made to live with, with his father, and his litter had to follow his father's and brother's carriage as often as they went abroad. So in this excerpt uh, we find familiar motives. Without any noteworthy military success, Domitian is reminded of his inferior status by his father and his brother, and he has to follow their carriage, at least, at least this time not on foot, but in his litter. Although, as Mary Nyquist makes clear, the term dominus has negative con connotations when used of a leader, and forms an integral part of the Roman anti tyranny invective. Authors like Eutropius and Aurelius Victor go not so far as to stigmatize Diocletian as a tyrant, but they underline with the slavery narrative the superior authority that is characteristic for his rule, in contrast to the Principate of earlier times. The tyrant motives are more apparent in another work that is far less balanced in its statements and the narrations of historians such as Atropius, Aurelius Victor, and Damianus Marcellinus. It is the work De Mortibus Persecutorum, The Death of uh, the Persecutors, of the early Christian author Lactantius. Lactantius has a, for him, that Arius was responsible for one of the worst persecutions of the Christians. In Lactantius' version of the events, the Ecclesians' activities were determined by greed or by fear. Lactantius presents Galerius as a driving force behind the persecutions of Christians and behind the abdication of the emperors Diocletian and Maximian. He uses all his rhetorical skills to portrait of arbitrariness in the darkest colors. He makes extensive use of images and practices that originate from the world of slavery. It becomes clear that Galerius wants to enslave the people. And I have here a short, uh, short excerpt. Because he could not do this by an express law, he so acted in imitation of the Persian kings as to bereave men of their liberties. He first of all degraded those whom he meant to punish. And then not only were inferior magistrates put to the torture by him, but also the chief men in cities and persons of the most eminent rank, and this too in matters of little moment and in civil questions. Crucifixion was a punishment ready prepared in capital cases and for lesser crimes, fetters. Matrons of honorable station were dragged into workhouses, and when any man was to be scorched, there were four posts fixed in the ground, and to them he was tied, after a manner unknown in the chastisement of slaves. Torture, crucifixions, change, and corporal punishment, these are practices that stand as symbols for slavery. So slaves were always questioned under torture. Crucifixion was a typical slave punishment. Slaves were prevented from escaping by chains and corporal punishment or the tail were reserved for slaves. And to give a brief outlook to the following tetrarchs, with the exception of Constantius Chlorus, Lactans also describes other tetrarchs as, for example, Maximino Styla, as Christian persecutors and as tyrants. For example, a popular tyrant motive is the dishonoring of free women. 
And this mode found, is found in the description of Maximinus Daya. It is further emphasized by the fact that Maximinus Daya marries the dishonored woman to his women to his slaves. This way he crosses the line between the honor of the free woman and the sexual availability of the female slaves. So the word of uh, free and slaves mingle. And it also fits this picture of the Emperor Maximinus Daria that he fled disguised as a slave after being defeated by his co-emperor co Licinius. So after great numbers had fallen, that's a quotation from Lactans, Daria perceived that everything went contrary to his hopes. And therefore, he drew aside the purple and having put on the habit of a slave, hasted across the Thracian Bosporus. So to conclude, I hope I could show convincingly how images from the world of slavery could be used in different ways to criticize an emperor's behavior, to illustrate his loss of authority, or to characterize the relationship between two emperors. Thus, the slave narratives form part of a power discourse, a discourse on power relations. So historians of the fourth century were well aware of the changed forms of rule. And they used well-known motive to illus illustrate these changes. Christian writers adopted the narrative to stigmatize the persecutors as tyrants, though they took up an old tradition. My analysis of the historical narrations on Diocletian and his co-emperors confirm what Hayden White says in his article on the value of narrativity in the representation of reality. And I quote, and this raises the suspicion that narrative in general, from the folk tale to the novel, from the annals to the fully realized history, has to do with the topics of law, legality, legitimacy, or more generally, authority. So, thank you very much for your attention.